Welcome back, everybody, to Harmonic Analysis Seminar. Today, it's our great, great pleasure to have Stefan Steinerberg from uh, University of Washington, who is going to talk about the nicest average and new uncertainty principles for the Fourier transform. Uh, feel free to start, Stefan. Please. All right. Thank, thanks so much for the invitation. Uh, this is a very fun sort of topic, and I, I, I came into this, and I think it's also a very open topic. There's a lot of questions that, that, that can be asked, and maybe some of them are very interesting. Maybe some are not interesting, but you know, one has to sort of see. But the story began um, two years ago, or maybe three years ago. And the story is uh, Ola Tsivinsky was is sitting in my office holding up a teddy bear without arms or legs. And that's a long story, which I will not explain here. And he asked me a very simple question. He said, uh, how do you average over past income? And so he's actually an economist. He works in taxation theory. So he needs to know how to average for past income. And you know, I said, you know, what are you talking about, right? There's, there's no question. You just sum up the amount of money you made the last year, right? And that's your past income. And then you have to pay taxes on this. And he said, well, well, it's not so easy. It's not so easy. And um, in fact, he told me the following story. He says there's a special rule that I think exists in Canada, uh, which is uh, if you're an artist, then it's understood that you will not make a lot of money because it takes a long time to produce some sort of album or some music or some theater piece, right? And then you release your album into the wild. And then many people buy your album and you make a lot of money that year but then you don't make money again for a long time because you produce the next album. So artists in Canada apparently have the option of um, saying they want to be taxed on the average income of the last five years, as opposed to the last year. So it sort of spreads out because otherwise they pay a lot of taxes the year they make money and then they don't make any money for a while, right? So you can sort of debate this, right? And, and now I think this is a really, really cool question that has been completely ignored. Uh, because from a perspective of sort of the pure analyst, averaging it is always just averaging. It doesn't really matter how you do it. But I think there's an interesting side story here. So here's an example, right? Suppose you have some sort of function like this, and it's you know whatever it is, and you can average over the function at a certain scale, right? So I could average the function using characteristic functions. I just convolve with a characteristic function, and of course, as we know, there's an averaging process that happens. Sure. But now I could also take an exponential distribution, right? It could convolve with a different function, and then I would maybe get this. It doesn't look that different, right? And now the question is, which one's the right one? And no one ever asks these questions because it doesn't matter, right? You see they're roughly comparable up to a factor of two. It's all up to constants. Who cares about this, right? It doesn't matter. Of course, if this is you know, millions of dollars, then maybe people will start caring about whether it's the, the yellow one or the green one. So here's, here's the question, right? The question is you're given a nice function and let's assume regularity is not an issue. So it's C infinity compactly supported and you wanna compute at a certain point an average. And of course it makes a difference whether you wanna average over the last second or the last year, right? So what also has to be sort of part of the problem is a fixed scale. You wanna fix over some scale lambda, that's also good. So how do you do it? Well, you could just average, right? <laughs> This is sort of what people do in practice, right? You just take an average over an interval of like And uh, this is the most classical one, maybe. It's the one everyone does. And I always thought, you know, it can't be very good. But then I started working on it, and now maybe actually it's quite good. <laughs> I'll tell you about this in a second. There's actually an open problem attached to averaging with just this. But of course, you could also take a Gaussian, right? The Gaussian is also roughly at scale lambda if you scale it correctly, and the Gaussian is very nice. It's a solution of a heat equation, you know, it's a semi group, right? It's a very nice object. Maybe it's a nicer one. So, which one do you pick? Well, <laughs> depends on what you're trying to do. And so, here's my question that is very broad and it's very philosophical what's, what's the best way of averaging? And the best is in quotations. And there's two parts to this question. This is why I think it has not been studied or not to the extent that maybe it should be. You have to first say what you mean by best. You have to actually write down some definitions. You have to make some assumptions, some accents. You have to make it rigorous. You have to turn it into a precise question. And then you have to solve the question. And this is actually an example of, this is not un uncommon in math. So this is known as the, the axiomatic method. You, you first define some sort of axiomatic framework for what you mean by best average or even average. 
and then you work within the framework. And what I think would be really, really nice if, if there were 50 different axiomatic frameworks for what you mean by averaging, and then seeing what's the best average for each of those. And it also has the effect of, 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 of really trans, it, it makes for a better conversation, right? Because instead of screaming, hey, let's take the interval versus, hey, let's take the Gaussian, you say, okay, what sort of axioms do we think are reasonable for an averaging process? What do we want it to do? And then what does it? What, what sort of things become admissible? It becomes a much more factual conversation. And in fact, this exists already. And the one, there's two examples that I know. One is cooperative game theory. So you have one piece of cake and you have two people and they have to decide on a splitting of the cake. And if they don't decide, no one gets any cake at all. So there's a strong incentive for them to agree. And then the question is, what's a fair division of the cake? Now, if you have identical twins that are identically hungry, right, then maybe um, there's not an issue. Everybody gets half, right? But what if some one person is very hungry and the other one just ate and is not hungry at all, right? And then you can sort of wonder. And they actually have a whole bunch of different axioms coupled with theorems that say if you agree to these axioms, the unique optimal way of, of cutting the cake is this. And if you agree to those axioms, then it's that. Okay, and the other example is actually computer vision. So the question of how do you smooth an image? What do you want? So you have basically a sort of a one parameter family of smoothing at various scales. And the question is what's the canonical way of doing it and applying the heat equation is one way of doing it. And that's sort of very popular. There's various axiomatic frameworks like this. So I'll give you my axiomatic framework and beware you can, you can disagree with me on this. It's axioms. In fact, if you disagree on, with me on this, you know, you might come up with your own axioms and that might lead somewhere else that's very interesting. And that would also be nice. So I want translation variance, meaning if I compute an average at a certain scale, at a certain point, it shouldn't matter where the point is, it should just matter what the function does in a neighborhood, not whether that's at zero or at five. I want constants to be mapped to constants, okay? So the average of the constant function one is one at all scales. I think this is natural. I want the thing to be linear. Some of that seems right. And maybe, maybe you don't agree with this, right? Maybe it shouldn't be linear, but I think that the average is sort of a linear process, right? And that already makes it a bit more specific because what you're really looking for is convolution, right? What you want is you want to convolve your function with some function G. That's what I think of as an average. And the question is, what's G? Right, there's a scaling, of course, you have to scale G up to your desired length lambda, but you know, is it a characteristic function or is it a Gaussian? So I think this is sort of maybe uncontroversial. So now I'll give you a controversial axiom. Um, what I wanted to have is I wanted to have the smoothest possible convolution. And I want it to be as nice as possible. And here's what I mean. What I do want is I want that if I convolve my function, which is just L2 in this case, with a function G, I want this to be as smooth as possible, meaning smallest possible L2 norm of the derivative. I want it to go up and down sort of the least or the least steep kind of changes. That's what I want. Well, and you may disagree with me on this. And maybe you want to put like an L4 here, right? I sure. That's why it's an axiom. I like this one. And, and okay, the two true stories, right? I wrote this down because I thought it seemed sort of reasonable. And then I tried to explore the consequences of this. And it led to so many interesting things that I never came back to the original axiom, but maybe I should go back and try something else entirely. But even this one already led down to some very interesting story. Um, so of course, you know, now you say okay, you make the G very, very flat, but there's, there's, there's a couple of, of, of conditions here, right? So number one, I want G to be uh, a function that has integral one, right? I want it to be a probability measure so that constants are mapped to constants. And I want this thing to have to be localized at a certain scale, meaning the alpha of moment should scale like lambda to the alpha and lambda is given. So that's a sort of a scaling condition. So among those two conditions, and it's very easy to see that if you don't have a scaling condition, you could make the chi just very, very, very flat and then you average over gigantic areas. And then the derivative of f convolved with chi is going to be very small. And the flatter you are, the smaller you are. So it, it's very clear that you need some sort of condition like this. And now here, here, here's the thing. Okay, so what's the best G? And you know, maybe there isn't one. You could sort of start wondering what's happening. 
Um, so if you do a little bit of free analysis, you realize that the best uh, chi, if you take the sort of best constant here, you can just do a little bit of L2, Plancherel, free transform. You realize what you want is you want this object to be as small as possible. So the Fourier transform of chi multiplied with psi, absolute values, the supremum of that should be as small as possible. Okay. Another question is, does this even have a nice answer? Because if, if you know, this can be zero or arbitrarily small, then there's not gonna be a nice answer. So the question is, does this minimization thing have actually a solution? Note that, and I'm very clear on this, right? I said I want the derivative to be as nice as possible. You could also talk about the second derivative or the 18th derivative or some fractional one half derivative or something else entirely. There's a lot of freedom here. I do L2 because L2 is the nicest for free analysis, but you could think about LP. You could think about L infinity and L1. And you could fix the scales in other ways than just fixing a certain moment, but coming from sort of, you know, I want it to be a probability measure a classical way of noting the scale of a probability distribution is really a moment. Like maybe alpha two, meaning a variance is the nicest, right? And all the, you, can, you can play with these things and I don't have a good answer as to what would be the best. I have one axiom and there are many others, but I'll talk about the one axiom. So the first, the first thing that you wonder is, is it maybe possible that this thing does not have a nice solution? And this led me to the following very fun uncertainty principle, which seems to be new. That's sort of the weirdest part. Like you don't expect new uncertainty principles in 2020, but uh, so it's just the following. You basically want for any parameter alpha bigger than zero, beta being bigger than n over two, n is the space dimension. You get a constant with the following nice property. Uh, well, it's really a weighted Fourier transform here, right? Weighted by frequency. It's a weighted function in spatial in space and here's an L1, here's an L infinity and there's a lower bound in terms of L1. What this says, let's specialize a little bit. If we go to one dimension and fix uh, beta to be one, this is exactly the problem we had before, right? We have a function that is in L1. In fact, it's a probability distribution. So this here is one, that's just a constant one. We fix, sorry about this, we fix some scale to be lambda, so this here, sorry, did not think about this, right? So this is lambda over here, also fixed. And I want this to be as small as possible. So this is exactly the kind of function I'm looking for. The extremal function for this uncertainty principle here is what I call the best function with respect to this axiom that I imposed. And if you additionally fix the variance, you say alpha is two, then for example, you get this sort of very fun uncertainty principle here. So you have L1, you have an L1, you have an L1. Now, generally uncertainty principles are, uh, you know, I would say a general uncertainty principle is just some form of compactness in space, right? There's nothing particularly substantial about, it's just, you know, you're trapping in space, or you're trapping in frequency, it's some sort of elementary duality of the Fourier transform. What would be nice, however, if you have uncertainty principles that have nice extremizers. And I think this is one of those. I think the extremizers of this uh, uncertainty principle are going to be very interesting. And not just because they're the best averaging functions in a certain sense, but I think I sort of know what they are and I'll tell you. And I checked the literature for like two weeks. I really spent two weeks just going through all papers on uncertainty principles in the last 50 years. I didn't find anything. I think the reason is there's an L1 here, which is a bit unusual. People like to have L2 in the lower bound. Once you put an L2, there's like, dozens. There's very few with an L1. And the fact that there's just an L infinity, it's, it's sort of L1, L infinity, rough endpoint spaces, if you want. Maybe it exists in some paper I didn't find from the 70s. You know, if, you, if you've seen this before, email me. So I'm not going to show you the proof of this because online talks are rough already. I'm going to show you that it's very short. Here's the proof, OK? It's very short. It uses basic properties of the Fourier transform. It's, it's not, there's nothing particularly substantial. If you do this proof, then the constants you get are terrible. They're very far away from the truth. This is proof is not going to get you to two sharp constants. Okay. So what can we say about the extremal function, which is of interest because it's the best average. 
And usually what's fun is when you, when you look at extremal functions in harmonic analysis for certain inequalities. So you look at extremal functions in classical hard analysis, right? You have Sobolev inequalities, you have gaudiado nierenberg inequalities. The extremizer either is a Gaussian or it's one over one plus X squared or some variation of some power on it, right? These are sort of the classical extremal functions. They're very nice, they're very smooth, very beautiful. Vague conjecture. I think that the extremal functions of uh, this uncertainty principle, if they exist, will actually saturate the L infinity norm over here infinitely many times. So if you, if you look at the free transform of the extremal function, What's sort of conceivable is that it assumes its maximum value, you know, weighted, but as a sign as well, right? So if, if you this weighted free transform, it could be that it assumes its L infinity norm at like three points, and then it sort of tapers off to zero. I don't think it does that. I think it actually, because I think if, if, if it were the case, right, if the extremal function would actually just assume the value of three points, probably you can tweak the function a little bit. Uh, to make it less than, L, you know, make the L infinity norm go down and make the other two quantities sort of work in your favor, right? It seems that any finite number of points, you could actually probably avoid this. And I, we, we've actually proven this with, uh, for another problem in free analysis about root uncertainty principles that's related to sphere packing problems. We did this with uh, uh, Diogo Oliveira Silva and uh, Felipe Gonsalves in 2017. There's a certain type of, harmonic analysis problem where we could prove that the extremal function, which is still unknown, has infinitely many double roots. So it sort of touches the x-axis from above infinitely many times, but never crosses. And that was exactly that kind of setup. So you have an L-infinity norm, and somehow it has to be saturated infinitely many times because it's an L-infinity, and it's pointwise, right? So I think it's going to be saturated infinitely many times, which has an interesting consequence, right? Because it would mean that, uh, among other things, you would have this as a consequence, which precludes a certain kind of smoothness, right? It would mean that the function is not smooth because if it was, you know, smooth in the best possible sense, the Fourier transform would decay faster than any polynomial. But here it wouldn't. So I think what's fun about this uncertainty principle is the extremizers are going to be uh, not nice. <laughs> but they're simultaneously the best averaging profile, so they can't be bad either, right? <laughs> so there's an interesting... Twisted. So a question for the audience. Is it maybe true that the classical, simple, straightforward averaging is actually the best way to do it? When I started, I thought it must be the worst, right? It's, it's, it's a characteristic function. It's a convolution of a characteristic function. A characteristic function is not even, it's not even continuous, right? It, it jumps. I mean, it's not nice. But maybe it's actually an extra miser of this. Which would also mean it would make sense, right? Because uh, the free transform of this thing is actually decaying like one over xi with a sign, like a sync function. You multiply it with xi, you just have a beautiful sign touching the upper bound infinitely many times. Isn't that nice? Wouldn't that be great? So, question is it maybe true for alpha bigger equal than two that the optimal constant is actually given by the characteristic function? How well, hard can it be? Well, I couldn't do it, um, uh, but it, there was some, there's, there's some recent work. Uh, uh, well, there's, what I could do is I could prove it's locally, it's a local minimizer in the class of even smooth functions on minus one half, one half. So if you take the characteristic function and you do a smooth perturbation that's even around the x-axis, then I could prove for alpha being two, three, four, five, and six, <laughs> that it's a, a local extremizer for this uncertainty principle. And I was able to find a condition that tells you for general alpha. And in a very recent paper from last week, this was actually settled for all alpha bigger equal than two. So I'm, I'm probably it's true, right? It sort of has to be. I'll show you what comes up when you try to do this. Because at this point, we're perturbing. We do a smooth perturbation of a characteristic function centered at the origin. And we take Fourier transforms. Everything should be explicit. And everything is sort of explicit. So you run into this very cute lemma, which is this one. This is uh, um, basically you take a free transform, you evaluate it at half integer points, and you weigh it, and you look at the maximum and the minimum alternatingly. 
maybe not the most natural quantity, but it's the thing you have to control if you wanted to perturbation theory. And it turns out <laughs> there's a very beautiful sharp inequality that says, you know, this thing is not too small with sharp constant. So this is the sharp constant, sharp inequality, sort of fun. And, you know, it's, it, this is elementary for your analysis. At this point, you really just compute things and you bound things and there's, there's not much happening. It's, it's, there's no technology in it. And I could do it for two, three, four, five, and six. And I'll tell you why I could do it for two, three, four, five, and six. Here's the lemma that you need when you do all the computations and all the, everything sort of works out very nice. I will also say this, like it's classical Fourier analysis, but someone's helping you along the way. Somehow all the computations can be done in closed form and everything remains nice until the end. Until you hit this one. So what you need for this local stability result is you need that this sequence of numbers. So this is a sequence of real numbers. It's just a hypergeometric function just uh, with an alpha is a parameter and here's a K and it turns out this thing alternates signs. That's all you need to prove. And I have no idea how to prove this. Except when uh, alpha is an integer big or equal than two, this turns into a trigonometric polynomial and then it's of course trivial, to, like an explicit trigonometric polynomial. You can just prove it by hand and nothing happens. And what happened is in this recent paper, uh, it was established that in fact, the sequence does indeed alternate signs for all alpha big or equal than two. I think for alpha less than two, it's false, which means that maybe this, uh, maybe the characteristic function is not an extra miser if alpha is less than two. And in fact, if alpha is like 1.4, you can easily prove that the Gaussian is better. So there's some threshold, and I think it's exactly alpha is two. Uh, so it's sort of fun. Okay, any questions up to this point? Just to clarify, so when uh, if you take characteristic function, the claim is that for alpha greater than two, uh, the characteristic is sharp, and this reduces to the question that the sequence a k alternates, right? Uh, for the local stability. Ah, only for local stability. Only for local stability. So this this now this result that was established uh, two weeks ago established local stability of the characteristic function for this inequality. I see, okay. And okay. it's only for local perturbations um, in the support of the function. So you could imagine that the characteristic function, if you, if you make it bleed out a little at the sides, right? Maybe you improve the constants. That's also not clear. However, it's certainly, it's certainly a very curious result, right? Because there's a very subtle oscillation that sort of seems to play, like the fact that the stability analysis is so interesting and leads to hypertraumatic function identities makes me think that very there's probably a very good reason why the extremizer exists and is the characteristic function or it's just a really interesting inequality that has a spurious pseudo local minimum <laughs> and in fact the extremizer is something else entirely but i don't think so i think it's actually a characteristic function which is a very elementary question when you look at it right i mean this is just a one function of one variable and you take a free transform and you ask yourself is this L infinity quantity large? You can, you know, this term you can kill with scaling. This term you can kill with scaling. <laughs> so you're down to one elementary inequality. So what, you know, what's going on? Um, so this is this is sort of and note also that this is just one D. You can ask all these questions in two D. I haven't even tried. Okay, other questions. Okay, so then what happened is I, I was telling, uh, uh, well, he was a former student, but now he's sort of a graduate student at a different institution, right? So I, I guess I can say he's a very, very good collaborator also, very smart student. I told uh, Noah about this. Uh, and Noah is actually working in combinatorics, uh, but he's interested in all sorts of math. And I told him about it and he asked a very simple question. He said, what about the discrete case? You see, there's a combinatorialist at heart. What about the discrete case? And yeah, I didn't think about it because maybe I'm not a combinatorialist at heart, I don't know. But it never occurred to me, but I, I thought actually if you do practical applications, right? You deal with time series, right? You actually have discrete numbers that you know you take a measurement once a second, right? So actually the discrete case is very natural for sort of applications. 
And Fourier analysis doesn't really care, right? I mean, Fourier analysis on, on the integers, on the lattice, is, is just as beautiful as Fourier analysis over the reals, right? So what happens? And then now my big general question, which I don't know how to answer is, you know, generally, what about groups, right? Because you can do Fourier analysis on groups. Uh, you can, the moment you have Fourier analysis, there's going to be uncertainty principles of this kind, maybe give an interesting extremize. What is the best averaging on the sphere? Right, if I want to compute the, I want, I want to do the weather report, so I have to average local information. I mean, how do you actually average temperature on the Earth? I don't know. And again, it doesn't matter up to constants, right? Whether you take a characteristic function or a Gaussian, but once you start wondering what the best average is, it's not so clear. Torus, sphere, finite groups, I don't know. But what I can tell you about is the lattice. And the lattice turned into an absolutely gorgeously beautiful story. And in fact, it was so beautiful that, you know, we, we said, oh, we, we discovered so many things. We need to be able to go back and solve the one dimensional case and prove that the characteristic function is optimal, but we couldn't figure it out. So C2, we haven't even tried because everything we do sort of fails, but now I'll show you very beautiful classical mathematics that we were at some point convinced had to be discovered by, you know, Hardy. And we didn't find it. I think it's actually here. So problem, same problem, but now we're discrete. So we have a function. Uh, we have a function from the lattice to the reals. And what we do is we convolve with the symmetric function, and the symmetric function is compactly supported, and it's supported on you know minus n to n. And by building this into the problem, we kill scale. Okay, because now the scale is already there. We do a time series average and we can look at n steps into the past, n steps into the future. That's it, part of the game. That's nice. Okay, and now uh, what are we gonna do is we're gonna average, we want constants to be mapped to constants. So of course we wanna assume that this is a probability distribution, maybe signed measure. But we wanted to add to one. And now the same question as before, we want the smoothest convolution. So the one that has the best constant for this inequality and this inequality is taken over all functions from the lattice to the reals. And of course, as you can see, the constant will depend on the scale n, right? As the scale gets wider, I can average over larger regions in space and I will get smoother functions. And the question is prescribing a certain scale, what's the best average? Same questions. Any questions? Uh, what's the gradient? Ah, that is a very good question. Uh, the gradient is uh, the discrete derivative. So it's just uh, how much you chop. So it's the little size one uh, derivatives. OK, so it turns out uh, we have a complete answer for this. Uh, the answer is very nice. It turns out, uh, no matter how clever you try to design your averaging function u, the average function cannot be much smoother than the original function. So there's always a, of course, if, if f itself, right, if the function you average over is extremely smooth, then the convolution is going to preserve this. So the question is, what's the worst case scenario? What's the worst function that gets the roughest smoothing? And it turns out this is the best you can do. And of course, as n gets bigger, you can see that it's spreading out more widely and uh, as, to, as to be expected. Moreover, equality is given if and only if the function is constant. So in the discrete setting, the best average is actually the one you do, you know, the one you learn in school, right? You add the numbers up and you divide by the amount of numbers you have, right? That's actually in this axiomatic sense, the best average. It gives you the smoothest average in terms of the uh, axiom. And this is, of course, the discrete analog of the characteristic function, right? It's just constant one. So of course you think, oh, I have a proof of this. I can go back and look at the characteristic function. And somehow it didn't work. There were always error terms we couldn't control. Though, of course, it, it seems like one should be able to just take a limit, right? Let n go to infinity and somehow, and maybe there is a simple trick. I don't know. This is... It's easy to go from continuous to discrete and it is from discrete to continuous sometimes. <laughs> um, 
The big question is, can one adapt a discrete argument to the continuous case? I don't know. But even the discrete argument has a very pretty ingredient. OK, now I'll tell you about what happens if uh, what happens. So, so I, I mentioned before, we could, you know, we could also do second derivatives, right, or third derivatives. And it turns out uh, the proof that we have also works for second derivatives. And now we have to have an additional assumption. Otherwise, it doesn't work. We, we need u to be a uh, positive definite in the sense of having a non-negative free transform. So now we're looking at, you know, we're looking at convolution operators that preserve the sign of the free transform, which is a well-studied object, and sort of natural. And it turns out there's a similar kind of inequality. And inequality says no matter how you design your function u, there's always another function f, such that if you convolve with that and take second derivatives, the second derivatives are not too small. And now it's a second order decay. Again, it, as, you, as, as you get wider, this gets better. You can build smoother operators, right? So that's the natural scaling you'd expect. And equality, you only get if you get the triangle function. So, you know, triangle function is the one that's just piecewise linear. And uh, can you see this? Like this one, right? And another way of thinking about the triangle function is, well, it's the convolution of the characteristic function with itself. Coincidence? I don't know. It doesn't look like it could possibly be a coincidence, but it doesn't really come out of our arguments whether it's a coincidence or not. Certainly, our arguments all fail miserably when you want to go to the third derivative. Because now you say, OK, you know what? I'm going to take the, the triangle function. I'm going to convolve another time with a characteristic function. And surely, that's going to be the extra miser for third derivatives. And it well might be. And these distributions actually have a name in probability theory. I forgot, but another well studied iterative convolution. They very quickly they start looking at Gaussian, right? Central limit theorem. If I convolve a characteristic function with itself many times, I get a Gaussian, morally speaking. So that also makes sense, right? You go to a limit, the Gaussian is the PPR. It's not clear. So, by what I can tell you, right? So, and so, so in fact, this, this suggests a natural question, which is, is it true that uh, if you go into the continuous case from first derivatives to second derivatives, is the extreme function then just, again, this, this magic triangle function, whose Fourier transform is just the square of the sink, right? It's sine x over x. It decays exactly like psi squared. If you multiply with psi squared, you get again a sine. It seems not inconceivable. OK, but now I'll tell you about the proof of this. Because this one, you know, you wonder, you know, what's the worst kind of case? Well, it turns out free analysis here reduces everything to trigonometric polynomials, as to be expected, right? I mean, cheese are function supported on minus n to n is symmetric. We're going to get some sort of real value trigonometric polynomial of degree n. So, what's the kind of question we need to answer? Well, turns out you can actually turn it into actual polynomials by just the usual trick. So here's the result that you need, which is sort of interesting in itself. And this is very closely related to Chebyshev and Chebyshev's equi-oscillation theorem. So there is a, there's a very fundamental question um, that Chebyshev raised, saying, you know, if you have a function uh, polynomial on the reals with real coefficients, and leading coefficient is one, so it can't be too small, what's the flattest polynomial? on a minus one one. And the answer is the chip chip. That's the one that minimizes the other infinity. And here what we have is we have a similar kind of statement, except we have a non-negative polynomial. And it can't be close to the zero polynomial because at one, it's one. Then it turns out that it's this sharp inequality. Uh, which says that the polynomial, if it's, you know, if it's, if it's um, Essentially, if, it, if it's one at one, then you know this weight here vanishes exactly at one, but it can't be too small in real worlds. It, it can't be too flat. And it can only be this flat. And equality is given exactly if you have this kind of associated or related Chebyshev polynomial. Turns out that is the only extremal function for this inequality. And again, you wonder, you know, truly this must be classical. This could even be 
maybe some very advanced Olympia type problem. Like you wonder, right? And we could not find this anywhere. And it should have dropped out naturally out of trying to understand the best average, which is why I think it's a good question. There's interesting things coming out. And so this is, this is the, 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 the result that we need for the first derivative. And for the Laplacian, there's a sort of algebraic miracle that happens, which is why we stopped at the second derivative and didn't go to the third. And the statement that we need is the following, again, just polynomials. Uh, if you have a polynomial of degree n, normalized it's not too small, but now there's no non-negativity assumption, it can be any polynomial, just not too small around one, then it's square can also not be too small. And again, I mean, but by, by, by sort of basic compactness and basic approximation theory, it's very clear that any problem of this type that you write down will have an extremal function, right? And we'll have a nice, uh, we'll, we'll have a solution, right? Because I mean, it's, it's all compact and okay, one minus X doesn't decay too quickly and polynomials are compact if they're normalized like this unless they're very large in this case, everything works, right? So it's clear that there are constants. What's less clear is that you can find the constants, that the constants are nice, and that you can understand the extra masses. That's, I think, the magic here. Because if, if, you, know, if you replace this by any, any other function here, if you replace this by any, any other function that's non-negative and vanishes at, at one, at a suitable rate, there's also gonna be another constant. But you would not expect the extremal polynomials to be nice. Here they're very nice. Here the extremal polynomials are suitable averages over Chebyshev polynomials. That's the only extremal kind of problem you can find. So, right, in summary, what we did is in the discrete setting, we asked the exact same question as in the continuous setting. We get nice answers for the first and the second derivative in L2. Of course, you can ask about LP, you can ask about all other function spaces, but at least this, this particular question became very, very nice. It seems to indicate that a certain very elementary inequality, elementary looking inequality for the Fourier transform is true. And there is even some emerging picture of all convolutions of the characteristic function with itself are maybe the one parameter family of extremizers that, that govern this Fourier analytic problem, right? We don't know whether that is true. And we get some very beautiful inequalities that are sort of, you know, elementary but non elementary that have nice answers and nice extremizers. And I don't know about you, but for these online talks, if someone stops 10 minutes early, I'm never too mad. So thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Stefan. That was a great talk. Uh, okay, does anybody have any questions? So what is the pretty argument for the discrete case for the original result? For, for the inequalities? Please. For the first inequality, yeah, for the... Uh, it's actually, so we didn't know anything. So we did some numerics and we found quickly that it has to be sort of this function because yeah, you see actually the weight cancels, right? It's a one minus X is here and the one minus X is here. So what you do in practice, you look at the polynomial times one minus X and you minimize that and you quickly see the answer has to be a suitably rescaled Chebyshev polynomial. Mm -hmm. And then what we did is we went into the literature and we tried to understand how the Chebyshev result looks. And it turns out the proof is more or less exactly the same. We used the Chebyshev equi-oscillation theorem, mm -hmm. which says that, you know, if you have, what is it? If you, have, if you minimize an L infinity norm, then basically you have to be positive, negative, positive, negative, positive, negative, and you have to assume the bound each time. Otherwise you can rearrange the polynomial a little and make it better. And it just turns out the proof of these results is actually fairly simple. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, once you know Chebyshev equi-oscillation. Another reason why we thought that this must be known. So but, there are results about uh, extremizing polynomials. They're called also Chebyshev polynomials uh, with respect to measures. So this may fall under this. I, I mean, it falls under, I would say it falls under the general framework and sort of yeah. the, ex so, so, but I think these results, they will depend much more strongly on the limit, right? Because the statements that you would expect is that if you have a suitably nice measure, maybe not even that nice, and you mm -hmm. try to optimize things like this, then there's going to be a nice canonical limit that happens to pop out when the degree of the polynomial goes to infinity. 
Mm-hmm. But what we're looking at here is really like, you know, this is already nice and highly structured for n equals four. Whereas I assume that if you optimize the degree four polynomial over general measures, you will not see anything particularly nice. Uh, I give a comment. This is Long Chen. Uh, so when you prove the convergence of conjugate gradient method, that's a, in general curl of subspace uh, method, that's an algorithm called conjugate gradient, uh, you will use this uh, similar estimate. You uh, minimize some polynomial, the L infinite norm, and the, the optimal one is a championship polynomial. Right, right, right. The championship polynomials are. You can check a okay. conjugate gradient, the convergence analysis of conjugate gradient. Conjugate gradient is a, is a very popular uh, iterative method. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I've used conjugate gradient. Uh, yeah, I mean, it appears, I think, naturally in a couple of places, strip shift polynomials. Yeah, it, it's very similar. I, I didn't say uh, obviously is a relation, but, uh, but uh, it's a very similar question. Mm-hmm. Any other questions? Well, Stefan, may I ask? Uh, may I ask one question? So uh, let's look at this in a quote. Let's take one minus x times px denoted by qx. Let, so it's degree n plus one polynomial. Yes. Let's call it qx. Why That's don't we just apply Chebyshev? Yeah, so to create uh, divide by one minus, it's yes. zero at zero, so it's derivative at one is- uh, The assumptions so are different. Chebyshev has the largest derivative at one, right? Yeah. The assumptions are different. Uh, Chebyshev no, wants, no, no, I, 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 no, no, I agree they're very similar. And that yeah. we also say this in the proof, and the proof is half a page using Chebyshev equi-oscillation, so they should be highly related. Uh, but the assumptions in Chebyshev are different, right? Because in Chebyshev, you, you fix the leading order, and here we fix the sum of the coefficients, right? Because P of one is one. So we fix the coefficient, the sum of the coefficients, not an individual coefficient. Now you might say that the result is similar enough to say that this can't be a substantial difference, but it actually took us quite a while to figure out that. We okay. tried very desperately to reduce it to straight Chebyshev, right? Because it seems like one minus X has to be Chebyshev, right? Rescaled. Yeah, it, if you rescale and shift, so maybe it, it reduces. But then we okay, couldn't, we couldn't, it doesn't. We couldn't okay. get it to work with the different assumptions. And then, but then you go through the Chebyshev proof and you realize the different assumptions never hurt you that much and it all goes through. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it's interesting that if, uh, in the second uh, question you get some of the Chebyshev. So it means that such simple reduction should not work just, just to one Chebyshev. And right, another that's question- also, That's also square, right? <laughs> yes, right, mm-hmm. it's also square. Another question, uh, in continuous setting, if you take characteristic function and convolve, you get triangle. Do you also get that for Laplace and in continuous setting triangle uh, is a local minimizer? So you have it in the, in the discrete d- d- uh, time con- I Let me think about this. I don't remember. I think, I think we did go back and try it. I think it worked. But they, that's been a okay. while. But it is the natural assumption, right? And yeah. somehow it seems like it's a very curious interplay because the moment you go from pre analysis, right? The moment you go from like L2 away to like LP, it's already rough. But the moment you go to L1 or L infinity, you assume an, a, a loss of niceness, right? Things tend to be not quite as nice. And here they are not as nice in the sense that the extremal functions are not smooth, right? But they still seem to be pretty nice, actually, and highly structured. And... And you had this beta equals one everywhere, right? Uh, no, so the theorem is completely general. In, in uh, local results, in local. In, the, in this, so for this, sorry, for this result, beta was one everywhere. That's right. Yes. And, and, in, and okay, alpha is ahead. always bigger equal than two for this local result. Uh, and it's, I think it's, I don't know what happens between, uh, I think if you look at the paper by, uh, that appeared recently, um, by, by these authors, uh, they show that things are false if alpha is less than five over three. So it's not a local extremizer of alpha is less than five over three. What I see numerically using the stability result here, if alpha is very close to two, then this thing, the sequence is alternating for a very long time and at some point it breaks. 
So I, I can't prove this, but I think for alpha less than, two, there's a threshold here. If alpha is less than two, this is probably not extremized by the characteristic function. And if alpha is 1.7, you can sit down, sit down with Mathematica and check a five dimensional subspace of functions and you'll find one that's probably better. So if alpha is far away from two, it's easy to do. If alpha is close to two, maybe it gets harder. And alpha is two seems to be the, the borderline threshold case where suddenly the characteristic function jumps up. Or maybe it's a spurious thing, but I don't know that many examples in analysis where you have a local stability of an object and it's not global. I mean, it can happen, of course, but do I expect it here? I think in, in Blush, Cassandra or in equality, there is something like this, but, there is, okay, but I'm, I'm not sure if I have to recall this. Uh, okay, that's very interesting. That's very, uh, uh, very nice. Uh, any other questions? Uh, uh, if no, then let's, uh, thanks, uh, Stefan. Uh, for the talk. Thank you. Thank you, Thank Thank you, you very so much. much. Very nice talk. Nice talk. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm.